blood, toil, tears, and sweat. Seven minutes. It only took seven minutes for Winston Churchill to deliver one of the masterpiece speeches in all of political history. Understand the powerful significance of Churchill's unpopular final warning. Next, on the Key of David with Gerald Flurry. Greetings, everyone. History tells us that Adolf Hitler would have won World War II. Many historians believe that, except for one man, and that was Winston Churchill. At one point in the history of World War II, if one man had caved in to Adolf Hitler, the war would have been lost, and that man was Winston Churchill. Just think about this, that uh, the entire civilization at that time, if it had not been for Churchill winning that battle, would have been subject to a homicidal madman. That's how bad it was. And before Churchill died, did you know he gave a warning for those of us today about something terrible that would happen if we didn't make some radical changes in our lives? He certainly did. What was that final warning he gave, that he gave to all of us? Now, we can avoid that problem and that crisis of crises that he was talking about. We can avoid that if we do something ourselves. We have to do something. So what was that final warning? Let's go back and look at a little history of World War II, and we'll uh, understand that much better. So even for nearly a decade, Winston Churchill warned his own people in the 1930s. He warned them and warned them, and uh, they didn't believe him for most of that time. The media didn't believe him. The other leaders didn't believe him. So he was essentially alone. He was alone in delivering that message, and uh, even America was at that time very much into isolation and didn't, didn't help Churchill early on, but there was just one man standing before Adolf Hitler at one point in our history, and if he had lost, Hitler would have won World War II. And that means he would have taken over Western civilization and perhaps even the entire world. That's how bad it was. And he gave us a warning that we'd better heed in this end time. So finally, of course, Russia and and America came into the war, and then uh, Hitler didn't really have a chance. But let's go back and get some of this history and uh, see what that greatest warning and final warning was from Winston Churchill. It, really, he was such a great man, and many historians will tell you that, that surely we ought to pay attention to what he said, and we're going to regret it if we don't. His number one political rival was Lord Halifax, and uh, so he came close to being prime minister himself. But he, he believed that if a man went out and fought and died, that didn't make him a hero. So he was very liberal in that way. And uh, they had uh, a pretty big clash before, just before Winston Churchill became uh, prime minister, and shortly after that. They were talking about, uh, well, there'd been an offer uh, from the uh, Hitler regime that there could be peace if, uh, if uh, Britain would do certain things, and Lord Halifax really wanted to negotiate a surrender. That's what it amounts to. He wanted to negotiate with them, and Winston Churchill says, if we even take one turn in that direction, we're going to get on a slippery slope, and we're going to lose this war. That's what he was talking about. That is what he meant. Now, he, he also said in, uh, in that short history that uh, he would rather die choking in his own blood than live under that homicidal madman. Now, he, he was that kind of a warrior, 
and he knew how vile and evil Adolf Hitler was, and it wouldn't be uh, a, a life worth living. Here's what he said just as he entered Parliament after he had been chosen as the leader of Britain. He said, I, I would say to the House, as I said to those who have joined this government, I'll just read you a little bit of this speech. But he said, I have nothing to offer but blood, toil, tears, and sweat. We have before us an ordeal of the most grievous kind. We have before us many long months of struggle and of suffering. You ask, what is our policy? I can say it is to wage war by sea, land, and air with all our might and with all the strength that God can give us, to wage war against a monstrous tyranny, a monstrous tyranny. This is powerful, and it's poetic, and it's precise, and how could people not understand? That monstrous tyranny never surpassed in the dark, lamentable catalog of human crime. Powerful words, a masterpiece of speaking to, the, to Parliament, unlike almost anything in the history of man. And it concludes by saying, That is our policy. You ask, What is our aim? I can Answer in one word, it is victory, victory at all costs, victory in spite of all terror, victory however long and hard the road may be, for without victory there is no survival. He said uh, victory five times in one sentence. He was talking about victory when they were on the edge of losing World War II. And that's the kind of voice that they needed at that time. He concluded by saying, Let that be realized, no survival for the British Empire, no survival for all the British Empire has stood. And even though he went on to say, Well, look, he has a lot of buoyancy and hope, and the people really needed to uh, hear that because the British Empire was, as he said at the same time, in a downward slurge, and slurge as he uh, termed it. And think about this, it only took him seven minutes in that speech, seven minutes to get these words across, and uh, I'm telling you it is one of the masterpiece speeches of, in all political history. And yet it was not well received, if you can believe that. But he was encouraged by an ex-Prime Minister of War, Lloyd George, and he, he said he had dauntless courage and, and uh, had, had a profound study of war. And he also said that his supreme responsibility at a graver moment and in times of greater jeopardy than have ever confronted the British Minister for all time. That was one of the few great comments about what he said. And it brought Winston Churchill to tears. It brought him to tears about just for somebody to say that. John Luke said, but I, when he uh, gave that, I have nothing to offer but blood, toil, tears, and sweat, he says that was not an empty phrase. These were words for a man who did not lose World War II, and he was about to lose it. And other politicians wanted to negotiate with Adolf Hitler, the monster. And Winston Churchill said, No, we won't do that. And uh, I tell you that uh, there was a reason for him to be talking about blood, toil, tears, and sweat in that order. So those words were not empty, and they changed history. Just a powerful speech like that began to really make people look at this more seriously and realize how terribly dangerous they were to losing World War II very early on. And God tells us we have even bigger problems in the future if we don't learn some spiritual lessons very soon. But uh, I just marvel that I've read that speech a number of times over the years, and I keep going back to it, and I'm still awed and moved by the depth of it, the depth of it and the power of it. And he really worked hard on giving that speech because he knew that uh, many people didn't like him, his own party didn't even give him a, an applause or a, 
standing ovation when he entered or when he uh, exited. Neither one. That's how bad it was at that time. And he, I think, if just looking at that history, really is, it deserves some concentrated attention. We ought to give him attention. John Lucas also said, Courage is a capacity to overcome one's fear. Now, you can overcome fear. He, Winston Churchill had to. He even, uh, early on in Parliament, had to went, to, went up to speak and was frozen with fear and had to rush back to his seat in a kind of a, well, a, a, a discouraging way. So he had to fight to overcome his fears, even just to get up and speak, much less lead uh, his nation to victory. If you look at 1 John 4 and verse 18, it says, Perfect love casts out fear. So if we grow in God's love, we're going to cast out fear. If we fear to speak out or if we fear to stand up, God says there is a way to get rid of that fear. There is a way to do that. So we need to keep that in mind. But anyhow, that was the final part of that speech, and uh, I tell you, it was uh, one of the greatest speeches in history, and there were people around him wanting to take the royal family and the crown jewels to Canada because they were so close to Hitler attacking, and he, he was just running over Europe and, and several nations already. France was almost defeated, anyhow, at this time, but something happened a little later that kind of rejuvenated uh, Britain, anyhow. But he said, I'm not going to send the royal family uh, to Canada and the crown jewels. He said that anybody that attacks this nation is going to rue the day that they did it. Now, that's the kind of courage that man had when they really didn't have um, any armaments that he'd been trying to get them to. To, uh, to build throughout the 30s, and they wouldn't do it. They were, they were trying to get everybody to disarm, thinking that would make uh, Adolf Hitler uh, a little more meek and mild, I guess, but it didn't work that way. But anyhow, there were three members of Parliament that uh, talked about already in France they'd, they'd lost 80% of their forces and feel that we deserted them when this uh, Dunkirk came up. And uh, Hitler uh, was really making slaves out of all those countries that he conquered. And one of those parliamentary members asked this question. He said, is this really the end of England? Are we witnessing, as for so long I have feared, the decline, the decay, and perhaps extinction of this great island people? Well, now, Nations can die, and they do all, oftentimes. If you know history, you know a lot of them have. And here they were asking, is this the end of England? They knew they were on a, uh, a down slide, and uh, that it might lead to their own extinction. Well, the Prime Minister Churchill still remained steadfast when nobody else did, it seems. But here we have uh, today, uh, uh, well, World War II was real. When you look into these events, you know uh, there was a lot of violence and discouragement and destruction like Europe had never experienced before in their lives. And here we are today with nuclear bombs just filling this world. And once you start dropping those, people just disintegrate by the millions. Think about today, and think about learning from Winston Churchill's experience. He warned, and he warned, and he warned, and they didn't listen. The media didn't listen. The educational institutions disagreed with him. It was really, really a man standing alone, and everybody else wanted to cave in. And if, it, if they had, can you imagine what this world would be like today if God hadn't intervened Himself? 
Can you imagine what we would be living under? And that, I, well, uh, surely I wouldn't be able to be speaking today like this if that had happened, uh, don't you think? I tell you, we need to think about that, and we need to think about the world that we live in. We need to think about that. He gave another speech after they uh, finally got out of Dunkirk with over 300,000 men that actually Hitler, if he had been wise, could have destroyed every one of them. But they did get out of there, but without their arms. They had to, had to get out of there as quickly as they could, get out of France. And a lot of the Frenchmen died at that time and were enslaved and put into extermination camps. But notice what he said a couple of days after that. He said, We must be careful not to assign to this deliverance the attributes of a victory. Wars are not won by evacuations. And here's the most memorable part of the speech. At the end, here's what he said. Even though large tracts of Europe and many old and famous states have fallen or may fall into the grip of the Gestapo and all the odious apparatus of Nazi rule, we shall not flag or fail. We shall go on to the end. We shall fight in France. We shall fight on the seas and oceans. We shall fight in, with growing confidence and growing strength in the air. We shall defend our island, whatever the cost may be even it's, if it's, well, choking on your own blood. That's what he said. He said, We shall fight on the beaches, we shall fight on the landing grounds, and we shall fight in the fields, and in the streets we shall fight in the hills. We shall never surrender. And even if which I do not for a moment believe, this island or a large part of it were subjugated and starving, then our empire beyond the seas, armed and guarded by the British fleet, would carry on the struggle until, in God's good time, the new world, with all its power and might, steps forth to rescue and the liberation of the old." You know what he was saying? He's saying, look, even if we get defeated here in Britain, we'll go on to our other Commonwealth nations, and we will fight from there, and we will never, ever surrender to this maniac, this madman. And we have mad men today that have nuclear bombs. And that's the most horrifying scenario you could think of, isn't it? When you think about it, what do we, can we really deal with these problems? How are we going to solve them? And we could solve them. We absolutely could. And you need to understand that, and so do I. But here, here was a great speech, and I'm telling you, this speech helped mightily in, in uh, standing up to Adolf Hitler when everybody else wanted to negotiate a peace, quote unquote, which would, was really slavery. It wasn't peace, but it lifted the spirits of all the people, and it brought tears to many of the uh, members of Parliament, brought tears to their eyes. I want to just talk to you here about one more speech he gave uh, when they really did win the battle in the air, when they were trying to destroy Britain. Just a few men did that, and he said, uh, he said at that time, on June the 18th, Hitler knows that he will have to break us in this island or lose the war. He knows that. He had to get rid of Britain. If only they'd cave in, he'd win the war. But if he didn't win over Britain, he knew other nations like Russia and the U.S. would eventually come in and Hitler had to lose. He knew that. Well, he said all these other nations in the whole world will sink into the abyss of a new dark age. A new dark age. Well, what does that mean? And he talked about those airmen who finally did drive the uh, Germans out of Britain, made them decide they couldn't take Britain at this time or destroy them. And he said that was their finest ever. He said, never have so many owed so much to so few. Courageous men that listened to his 
speeches and were moved and stirred by them and willing to risk their lives to stand up and fight. And that's the kind of strength we need today. We're facing a new dark age, a nuclear dark age, and we need help from God. We need help from God, and we all really, really need to see that. How could it be any worse when you think about it? How could it be any worse? Churchill said, Upon this battle depends the survival of Christian civilization. This was his historical vista that he saw. This was his vision. And he really was a man who knew history. And before he ever, well, when he was in India, he had, a, had a spare time and he just devoured all the, uh, well, the histories of Gibbon, world history of Gibbon and uh, Macaulay and the history of England. And he, he really had just an epic sweep of history in his mind all the time, and he learned lessons from that past history. And can we learn a lesson from him? He learned lessons from the past and was inspired by those lessons and saved Western civilization. Can we learn from his history? I'm telling you, we're, we're at the edge of a new dark age if we don't wake up and see what we're facing in this world. Notice what he said to give us a final warning. I want to read it to you. It's very brief here. Mankind has never been in this position before. Without having improved appreciably in virtue or enjoying wiser guidance, it has got into its hands for the first time the tools by which it can unfailingly accomplish its own extermination. Its own extermination. Wow, you mean we can destroy all mankind? That's what he's saying. Death stands at attention, he says, obedient, expectant, ready to serve, ready to shear away the peoples in mass, ready, if called on to pulverize without hope or repair what is left of civilization. Now, isn't, aren't those powerful words? And he's speaking to us. A final warning. What are we going to do about this? You see, back in the time when he was warning his own country, people were saying to the leaders, Speak to us smooth things, like Isaiah said. We, we don't want to hear that. We don't want to hear the bad news. It's almost like we just blot it out and don't think about it and don't realize what is facing us. Notice Matthew 24, verse 21, For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. Now here's Jesus Christ talking very much like what Churchill talked about. A great tribulation in a time of trouble that we've never seen since the beginning of man. Jesus Christ's own words in red letter. You can read it. You think we should heed what Mr. Churchill said, since he agrees with Jesus Christ? But Jesus Christ has something that gives us hope. Verse 22, And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake those days shall be shortened. No flesh saved alive? Well, that's what Churchill said. We can, we, we can now exterminate ourselves, everybody. Every man, woman, and child. Can we solve our problems? Well, Jesus Christ said, no, we can't. And if He didn't intervene and stop it, there would be no flesh saved alive, as it says in the Moffat translation. No flesh saved alive. And that's going to happen in spite of man, whether he obeys or not. But God says, why will you die? O Israel, and he's talking to nations there when he said that. And if you don't understand that, you need to write for our book on the United States and Britain and prophecy. Iran is racing to get nuclear bombs today, and those people actually believe, the, the Iranians actually believe 
the people in power and those that follow them that uh, the more chaos they cause, the sooner their version of the Messiah is going to come. That's what they believe. And they are the number one terrorist-sponsoring nation in the world. I mean, this is madness. Just like Adolf Hitler was. See, we need to listen to Winston Churchill's warning. We need to listen to what he had to say, but most of all, we need to listen to Jesus Christ and what He said about this horror of horrors, and He is going to stop it in spite of what man does. Until next week, this is Gerald Flurry. Goodbye, friends. Request Gerald Flurry's booklet on Winston Churchill to learn how his warning applies directly to you. Also request Ezekiel the End Time Prophet and Nuclear Armageddon is at the door. All our literature is available free of charge at no cost or obligation to you. Order now. The preceding program was a paid presentation of The Key of David, brought to you by the Philadelphia Church of God.